Well, we've all done it, especially during the holidays, overindulged on food. But for some of us, it is more than an overindulgence. In fact, our next guest goes so far as to call it an addiction. Joining us now for more, here's Vera Tarman. She is the author of Food Junkies, the truth about food addiction. She's also medical director of Renaissance, an addiction treatment center in, among other places, downtown Toronto. We're happy to have you here at TVO. Thank you. Uh, I think what's interesting about this book in particular is that you are, are you a cured addict or a former addict or how do you want to put it? Uh, recovering food recovering addict. Recovering addict. Yes. This was your problem. Uh, yes. Describe yes, it. it. What, what, what was it like? Uh, well, it, what, what it was like was in my earlier years, in my 20s, I found that um, I just, uh, just kept eating and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And at, at some point, I just gave up and said, whatever, I can't stop this. Um, and then, uh, at, at, I mean, you know, it has to stop at some point. I was like 100 pounds more than I am now. Uh, and it just, I just woke up one day and I said, I have to treat this like it's a drug. Because I'd tried many diets, tried many, many different things, and none of them worked. But when I took that approach, it worked. Were you a medical doctor at the time? Um, I was uh, actually in training at the time. And then as I got more in interested in uh, medicine, I got more interested in addiction medicine. And then I started looking, OK, where's the data that shows that I'm right, my intuitive sense of mm -hmm. this? Um, and I couldn't find anything. I just couldn't find anything, which really irked me. Because no one thinks of food as an addiction. No. Well, and, and, uh, maybe you, you know, they might laugh and joke about it. Oh, well, I'm, I'm addicted to chocolate. But to take it seriously on a clinical level, no, they didn't. It was always called an eating disorder. What was your poison of choice? Oh, gosh. Uh, I, I, multiple, it, okay, uh, basically sugar and, and flour, but in multiple forms, as you know. So, you know, it, I loved pound cakes. I loved um, Richard D's. I loved, I mean, it, it, it was... It was like the, the flavor of the, of the week. If it was bad for you, you wanted it. Uh, pretty much, yeah. And yeah. how did you eventually come to the realization that, or I guess what empirical evidence did you eventually find that suggested this is actually an addiction in the same way that cigarettes are, are an addiction, right. not just a question of, I can't control my eating. Yeah, well, you know, it was like this intuitive sense and then that, the fact that it worked, that really guided me. And it wasn't until uh, 2008, I think it is, uh, the American Journal of Addiction Medicine came out with Nora Volkov uh, saying uh, food can be an addiction. And, when I, and it was like a, a, an issue for addiction doctors dedicated just on that issue. And I thought, now I've got my evidence. They, they were looking at PET scans, they were looking at neurochemical um, um, well, theories, um, and uh, it was like, now we've got the science that we're starting to uh, look at this. I mean, we're still cutting edge. What's the difference, though, between somebody who maybe gets home from a late movie at midnight and decides, yeah. oh, I want a half a carton of ice cream before I go to bed, versus genuinely addicted to whatever the chemical stuff in the food is that yeah. creates that chemical reaction in it, your body? It's such a good question. I, I, I like to think of it really as a continuum because food, we are, we are we're, we're wired to enjoy food and we're wired to enjoy high fat, high sugar foods. And so if you think about it as a continuum, um, a person who might overindulge would be on this side. And, and I like to think of it as that we have um, the, the uh, sort of um, Yes, the, 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 p the pieces that want us to do something. And then we have the inhibitors. Um, I'm full. You know, I'm feeling a little bit woozy. I'm feeling a bit sick. I've had too much. And when the yeses outweigh the noes, uh, that's when we're moving into a more dare dangerous territory. And why that would happen would be because of a person's sensitivity to uh, the sugar or the flour, whatever mm -hmm. that substance is, so that even though they're full, even though they feel sick, they still want. They it's keep that going. itch. You want, you want, you want. What are the, what, I mean, presumably you've identified what the actual chemicals are or the chemical change that happens in the body? Well, that's, that's kind of, uh, well, yes, so there's two pieces to that. Uh, one of the things we're discovering is that it's the same phenomena that happens with sugar uh, as, as what happens with cocaine, believe it or not, or even opiates like our, our previous talk. Um, it's the same phenomena, the same neurochemicals, the same part of the brain. Um, now, what will addict me compared to my, what might addict you may be different, although we can probably universally say that sugar is number one. I mean, it seems to capture a number of neurochemicals um, it, along the same pathway. We've, we've shown, and this is actually science that's, uh, that's uh, quite prevalent, uh, that um, rats will choose sugar over cocaine. I mean, mm. you know, this, uh, there it is. <laughs> Well, so would I. Is that a big, uh, <laughs> is that a big finding? <laughs> um, 
If you had already been primed to uh, desire cocaine, I guess maybe that's the piece there. Uh, okay. um, you, you would then, uh, well, you may then uh, be surprised that you choose sugar as much as cocaine. Yeah. Well, following up on the example you just gave, I think we have a basic understanding of when somebody who's a cocaine addict needs a hit of cocaine and the behaviors that are manifested in that circumstance. Mm -hmm. How about for food? Well, okay, so uh, from an addiction uh, point of view, we have uh, particular ways to diagnose or like red flags that we use to say oh, this person is addicted to something. Because if you drink alcohol, you'll get drunk, like everybody will. But who's the person who keeps drinking when they should stop? Um, so who's the person who keeps eating when, and, and, and you know, not just overeating, but eating, eating, eating beyond that? So we have some features uh, in addiction. It's, it, one way to say it is the ABCDEs of addiction. Do you fulfill all these criteria? Do you, when you want to abstain from something, are you able to abstain? I, I'm not going to eat my chocolate anymore. I'm going to stop, and, I, and you can stop. But usually you can't stop. Um, B, do you have behavioral control? I'm just going to have three, and that's all. Even if it's three little bags of chips, but you end up eating more bags of chips. Um, C, the big one, do you have cravings or obsessions about it? You know, I am having a hard day. I'm thinking about that haagen dust tonight. And if I don't get the haagen dust, I will drive across town to get it, my particular variety. Um, D, do you diminish or deny uh, the consequences? I've got diabetes. Yeah, it's bad, but it's not as bad as insulin-dependent diabetes. I'll wait until then. Um, uh, and then E, do you have an emotional relationship that is unusually strong? You know, like food is my best friend. So I'll if you can check food. those five A, B, C, D, E boxes, yeah, yeah, you've I mean, probably got an addiction to food. Yeah, I mean, we have actually a criteria that we're using, but they're based on that concept. Hmm. Well, now, again, similarly, if somebody is uh, experiencing the withdrawal symptoms okay. from cocaine or heroin or whatever, we mm -hmm. know what that looks like. Yes. How about for food? Well, see, that's one of the main uh, contentious points because I'm talking about food addiction primarily because uh, uh, the medical establishment, the clinical establishment, doesn't want to accept it yet. And one of the... Uh, criteria or, or um, arguments that they use is there's no withdrawal. It's not like alcohol. There's no seizures. There's no shakes. Uh, and Or with cocaine where there's that crash uh, for a few days. Uh, but we, uh, I would say you just haven't asked somebody who's binged on two tubs of haagen the night before. Um, ask them how they feel the next day. They're depressed. They're full of self-loathing. They're having diarrhea. They're having shakes. They may have sweats. They probably didn't sleep that night. Tell me how that looks different than um, another withdrawal. Hmm. I, I just think they haven't asked those questions. Questions to and, the right people. And again, for, like for cigarettes, they put nicotine in the cigarettes to make them addictive, right? Exactly. I mean, that's part of it. Yes. So what are, they, what are the food manufacturers putting in processed food or refined sugars or whatever to well, make them addictive? I mean, I mean that's, you hit it right on the head. It's, it's the fact that it's refined. Um, we could probably, well, we can handle the sugar of an apple or strawberries. Like, that's the kind of uh, um, sweetness that, that my biological brain and yours is wired to enjoy and seek. Um, but when you take uh, out something from its natural context, and they're, you know, Mars bars don't grow on tree. They are, re they are refined products. And they taste fantastic. They do, because they've been um, heightened. Uh, they They've been refined so that they're poten uh, potentiated, and also we eat them in a, and, well, I mean, it, it, it overpowers what, it, what our system, which is really primed to handle apples and strawberries. It just overpowers it. Hmm. Um, and, and, you know, we've got books like uh, Michael Moss's book from uh, one or two years ago talking about the food industry, um, deliberately engineering foods to make them addictive. David Kessler, in his book, um, The End of Overeating, a few years ago, called them hyperpalatable. This is the former head of the FDA? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, I actually found him on, uh, on uh, Facebook or something, um, and I said, David, why, do you, why are you calling it hyperpalatable? Can't we call it addictive? And he said, yes, we could, but nobody would buy my book if I called it that, and nobody wants to use that word addiction. Why so, not? What's the fear? Because it, it, who wants to be called an addict? I mean, you know, it's, it, 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 there's the stigma behind it. There's the implications behind it. There's the moral depravity behind it. Whereas if you just say um, it's an eating disorder, or which is what generally people do, or it's because of the, I don't know what else they say, but anyway, th th then you can get away from that. How would you distinguish between an addiction of food, yeah. which you've been describing, and merely, if I can put it that way, 
a f uh, an eating disorder. Well, this is another big contentious issue because if somebody today um, says, I've got a problem with my eating, um, they would uh, uh, go to the hospital or, or clinic and get uh, referred to an eating disorder clinic. And um, at this stage, uh, I mean, we even try to get it, we, I mean, people in the, in the food addiction field try to get it um, uh, put into the new DSM-5 saying, look, this is a separate disorder. Um, and they said, no, at this stage in the game, we don't have enough research because it looks too much the same. There's a lot of overlap. And and there really is a lot of overla overlap. Um, and and, and uh, I think really it's the proof is in the pudding. If you can um, succeed in the program of an eating disorder, which is moderate, moderate eating, then you're not a food addict. But if the moment, you, it, like any diet, you know, you stop the sugar, you stop the, the bagels or whatever, but the moment you introduce it, you're off and running again, you're off your diet, that's something that is suggestive of a food addiction. Well, let me do treatment with you then. In, in the same way where I don't know. You, I mean, if you've got a heroin addiction, I, I presume you don't go cold turkey. You've got to sort of ease off. Mm -hmm. Do you do the same thing for food? Uh, that, well, that depends. So there's different approaches. Um, sometimes with heroin addiction, addiction, because it isn't actually, it's a very miserable withdrawal, but it's not a, a fatal one, um, people will go cold turkey. So, mm -hmm. so some people may just go cold turkey. Um, Would or, you recommend that for food? Um, well, it's, you have to have a lot of support. I mean, food is so ubiquitous. I mean, I can tell you that I've quit eating sugar, uh, but, you know, the moment we're at a Christmas due, you're going to say, have a piece of cake. You know, it, it's not like with the same respect as I quit smoking you're not going to say have a smoke, right. you know. Right. Um, uh, so it's really, really hard. Uh, I, personally, I would probably say if you, if you if try the cold turkey, if it doesn't work, then do something like uh, just eat natural sugars like um, apples. Like have, if you're used to having your tub of haagen at night, get um, a big thing of cherries or a big thing of grapes. It's still too, sh too, it's too much fructose, but it's better than what you're doing, and then you can wean off that way. Because I would, I would imagine if you're accustomed to, let's say you have a tub of haagen every night before you go to bed. Yeah. Which I presume is not good for you. No, it's not. And then you and suddenly. And not uncommon, by the way. And not uncommon. Yeah. Huh. And then you decide, okay, cold turkey, no more. Yeah. I would presume that, like, the craving in the body Absolutely. for that would be so intense yes. that it, it could. I mean, it, it yeah. really could mess you up pretty good, couldn't it? Could, it? it could mess you up pretty good, and we don't have the supports. And we don't, it, they don't have to be supports, uh, uh, you know, through calling a counselor. They can, I mean, there's a lot of 12-step pr programs. There's community programs. If this condition were acknowledged, we could actually have more community supports. Because you need to be able to call somebody at 11 o'clock at night and say, I'm going nuts, help me. Oh, well, that's interesting. We, so you're saying there's an AA for food? There is. There's there actually, is. there's OA, um, Overeaters Anonymous. Uh, there's a, a Food Addicts and Anonymous. There's actually something like 12 different 12-step um, um, uh, programs, and if they're not in Toronto, they're online, believe it or not. Huh. Okay, so you've put this, you've put this I, I hesitate to call it a theory because that means you, I, I don't mean to suggest you haven't proved it. Uh -huh. So what do you want to call it? The, the notion of addiction to food uh -huh. is an established scientific fact in your view um, now? I, I want to say it's a clinical entity that we need to have established as a clinical entity. And I'm wondering, yeah. I raise it because I'm wondering how much pushback you're getting from either the medical or political establishments which don't want to recognize it. Um, from, I would say probably from the medical establishment, I'm getting more just uh, in the polite forms like the uh, DSM-5 uh, committee that said, no, let's just make this an eat, uh, a binge eating disorder. This is um, the, the psychiatric Bible in us. Exactly, in yeah. I, I think it's more just, uh, uh, we don't want to call it that, uh, let's call it this instead. And, and, and the, I would say probably the biggest pushback uh, is from the dietary industry, the nutritional industry um, that, that follows the eating disorder model, which is the prevalent model today um, wh where they say okay what is the solution that you're ultimately um, implying here if you're taking an addiction paradigm putting on those glasses it's to abstain from your addictive substances and the uh, uh, eating disorder paradigm would say no we can't do that we have to suggest moderation I'm going to teach you how to have just one donut every two days Mm. Um, and th we would say that's not going to work. That's only going to bring back the craving and uh, per put the person back into an obsessional mode. It's a clash of paradigms. But in the same way, it took decades. I mean, I think yes. many of us can remember going to our doctors who smoked, yeah. right? right, 30, 40 years ago. Yes, yes. Uh, in the same way that it, it can take decades to recognize 
the addictive qualities of a certain product. Yes. Maybe, uh, yes. I mean, you're just at the beginning of a very long fight. I, I'm hoping so, and I'm hoping that this book can be a vehicle towards that fight uh, in the same way hmm. that the, the, you know, smoking, people have even said, you know, food is the new smoking. Hmm. Uh, you know, we're starting to recognize, well, we're now uh, openly recognizing how the uh, tobacco industry targeted young teenagers to smoke. The food industry has targeted kids, kids who don't even have the choice of what, what they eat, to be given cereal and pop, and, and basically we are creating food addicts from the get-go. Okay, but let me see if I can make a comparison again here. Yes. We're now at the point where smoking is heavily, heavily regulated yes. in society. You can't do it in any of the places that you used to be able to 25 years ago. Exactly. And, uh, I mean, drugs the same way, obviously. We haven't yes. decriminalized anything yet, and who knows, maybe marijuana somewhere down the road. Can you really envisage a society that treats food in the same way and regulates it as strenuously in the same way? I, I don't know if it would be necessary to do that. Let's just go back 70, 80 years ago when it was, it was normal to have one dessert maybe once a week. Um, and it was a little bit, it wasn't a huge thing. Let's not make it so ubiquitous, so um, uh, expecting that, you know, every time you go to Starbucks, you're gonna get a, 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 one of those pastries. Um, if we can get back to, and, and let's start eating more fruit instead. Like, I don't know if we have to go to back to regulations. It, it, it's a matter of, let's acknowledge what this is, respect people who are in the middle of it now, and uh, find some ways to um, take it out of, I don't, take this out of our faces in the way that it is now. Yeah. I don't know if it's possible to go backwards, but though. But you know, I mean, the problem you're dealing with here yeah. is that an apple just doesn't taste as good as a Tim Hortons honeydew, honey dip donut. Fair enough, but let me, let me stop you there. Um, if you um, decide I'm not gonna have any more Tim Horton honey dip donuts, um, four or five weeks later, they are going to be too sweet, and an apple will taste good at it. Now that's it, true. It, it only takes a few weeks for that to go away. You just have to you you, you just have to make the decision to to stop. Yeah. And then a month later, if you tried it again, it's true. It would taste. It would be too much. It would be too much. Exactly. Hmm. And and that's really the, the essence of abstinence. It, it's the message of hope, really, that I'd like to give in this book is that for those people who have suffered, it's not like you're living in misery and white knuckling it the rest of your life. It's actually only three or four weeks, and then it's like I can't believe I ate that stuff. Hmm. I can tell you, Steve, I really, really, really enjoy a baked apple at night. Do you, so are, are your days of, of uh, overindulging on donuts and chocolate and all that, are, are they gone? Oh yeah, I haven't had sugar for 10 years. And I have what? not suffered what? What? for no. it. Wait, wait, you have not had, like, no sugar at all? No. No refined sugar, you no mean? No refined sugar. Obviously I mean, sugar from fruit, but uh, not? Exactly, yeah, yeah. You haven't had a chocolate bar in 10 years? I have not had chocolate bar in 10 years. Do you drink years. coffee? Um, I drink coffee without sugar. Or, and I don't eat sweetener anymore either. Really? Yeah, and it, it's, I can tell you, it's actually quite easy. I, I really, I go to Starbucks every day, and I look at those treats, and I go, I used to buy those morning, afternoon, uh, lunch, or whatever, uh, and uh, I'm so glad I don't anymore, because I remembered the dizzy feeling mm. that I felt after, and then the crash later. You haven't None had a soda pop happens. in 10 years? No, <laughs> not you even a diet You have not had a Coke in 10 years. <laughs> no, huh? I haven't, and it's great. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is a, f oh, boy, is this ever the ultimate uh, test of willpower and a tough time of year to try to get this message across but, with all the Christmas yeah, stuff going on. Yeah, but it doesn't on. feel like willpower. That's the whole thing, really. Now after, it's just the new normal. Yeah, it's the new normal, and it's oh. actually the relieved new normal. So I say I'm recovered. Neat. Yeah. We're, we're glad for you that you're recovered. Yeah, thank you. In the meantime, look at the cover of that book. Yes. I mean, how do you look at that I book know, and not I just know. want to dive I know. in? It's like I said, that's food porn. <laughs> the Truth About Food Addiction, Food Junkies by Vera Terman. Thanks for visiting us at TVO tonight. Thank you for asking me. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.